Okay, we're live on Facebook. Hey guys, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm here with Scott Botorf, who is a fascia specialist. He's a former professional hockey player, bodybuilder. Uh, Scott, you have this incredible mix of experience and it brought you to working with the fascia. So we're, we're here today really to jam on a couple different topics. The future of sport conference this summer is coming up and there's a lot of the work that you do that affects the entire athletic life cycle. But the first place I want to start is just how did you end up getting to the work that you're doing now on the fascia? That's actually a pretty good uh, question, Josh. Um, I, uh, I guess throughout my whole athletic career, since the age of four, I was really, really uh, into being, you know, the best and trying to get my performance to be the top, you know, as far as uh, if it's my speed, my agility, my endurance, and so on. And so, you know, that was obviously fascia. Well, I didn't know fascia about when I was four uh, years old, but like, <laughs> but I mean, as I started to play hockey through the ranks, and um, and I was um, playing juniors and and playing the U.S. development program and so on, the uh, you know the I. I was learning about tissue and about weight training and about strength training and everything. But I, I knew through uh, more intuition that there was something more than muscles. Mm -hmm. And there was something more than just weight training or, or strength training. And that there was something greater than like lifting weights or muscles. And so um, this was more of an intuitive thing. And, and I, I just, I don't know, I came upon it, I think it was more when I started studying uh, Chinese medicine, because I was like, you know, the, I was getting acupuncture done, you know, for performance and for health, you know, when I was playing hockey. And I was like, well, what encapsulates all these meridian or nerves? I mean, that, that's got to be a pretty great thing. And so then I figured out that, you know, this was called fascia. And now when I was in school uh, for PT, uh, mm. which I dropped out of because, well, I, when we did the dissections, uh, uh, and uh, on the uh, we did the on the bodies and stuff and on the animals that we I saw fascia and I got to open it with my hands and the teacher says oh don't worry that's just the fascia it's just a covering like the skin on a chicken and it absolutely it does nothing it just is a placeholder and this is again a five or six year PT program let, let you mind and I was like I was pulling it apart and I was like wait how is this nothing and it was like these different like three-sided polyhedrons like very kind of like and i was like pulling it apart and it looked very crystalline and it was holding in front of me and i was like this can't just be a covering this looks like a whole nother universe basically yeah. and so i guess like that was um i think that was like a freshman or soft i think it was sophomore in college when that happened yeah. and um and uh i was like i was blown away because they said it did nothing and so mm -hmm. after that i ended up going into like uh, let's call it like a, a like this amazing frenzy of study of looking yeah. at books and looking at people and looking at videos and and looking at you know everything you can about fascia and i and i was my intuition was correct it, it is very uh, amazing and it has a lot of implications to it as far as health as far as performance but as far as connection between us and the world and the universe which that, you know, there's a whole greater uh, meaning of it too, you know, which is quantum. So I, I mean, I kind of knew this, and it's just something in our culture that's not known of or even addressed or no one knows, like no, someone may live their whole life and may not even know that this, this structure of their body that can actually change their health and performance. It's kind of wild, but, um, but yeah. Uh, that's a perfect place to start though too scott because it like what so what is the fascia if you had to describe it from a especially from an athletic standpoint what it what is it and what is its role within that context of sport well it's let's put i'm trying to make this simple i guess and if it's not simple enough let me know just to let people know it's your structural integrity it's like your it's like a scaffolding on a building like 
you it's like i like to tell people it's a super suit but it gives us structure without it there would be no structure there would be no it's our architecture you know like an architecture builds a building right and a building has a shape right yeah. and everyone's like well that's an amazing shape i love that building well the fascia is our architecture that gives us our shape and so it not only gives us shape but it also gives uh spaces uh for organs and for uh muscles so it of space for organs and muscles and compartmentalizes everything and organizes everything uh, quite nice actually so uh, but this 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 architecture or structure it can it can move it can twist it can turn it can stick it can tense it it's very functional for survival um, but without it we're, we're we're just bones and muscles just in a bag just like sliding on the floor which is sounds pretty horrific like some sort of, sort of new horror movie but the thing is that um yeah this is this is the very thing that encapsulates our blood vessels encapsulates our arteries encapsulates our muscles encapsulates our bones our ligaments everything so it's like it's it's a it's it's an imperative structure but it is something that everyone is has but no one knows anything about which is kind of mm -hmm. it's kind of wild so what why isn't it more talked about in and if it's fair to just say this kind of western whether it's medical or performance model but just in general why is this not something especially as athletes i mean as we dive in today i think it's going to become really apparent to everybody and, and thank you guys for being on and watching and, and i think it's going to become apparent to everybody that like this is a critical component of athletic performance that most of us are walking around without the faintest idea of one, that it's part of us and two, what to actually do with it. Yeah, it, I always find it, well, for myself, odd that this isn't really taught in our educational system. Um, and there's probably, there's a lot of reasons for it I can get into, but I, I'm not going to. Um, but the the education on how on the understanding on how the body works is much different, uh, you know, in the West than it is in the East. They have a lot more, let's say, experiential data, mm -hmm. like uh, thousands and thousands of years of experiential data. Uh, but it's through physical practice. Now, it's this is a big thing is that. Uh, a lot of Eastern cultures do physical practice every day, but in the, in our, you know, in the West, we do more of this, an intellectual practice, mm. like more like, um, we like to intellectualize, we read things, we study things and books and PowerPoint and write things down, but we're not opening the body to learn this. We're learning from a book or we're learning from a teacher or we're learning from a, a PowerPoint thing. So this, does not make us embody the information and so this is a problem because well we know it through our mind but we don't know it through our bodies and so um so it's wild and it's just I, I think it's because through the education and then the understanding of the body uh in the west is very skewed and misunderstood and obviously too the country's financial systems depend on a different method of treatment um, as far as Western medicine and pharmaceutical drugs, that also plays a big part in it too. So. So what is that difference for an athlete between knowing something intellectually and being able to embody it? Well, there's, I mean, every athlete will learn differently. However, whenever an athlete learns um, some might want to try that some athletes might want to idealize a movement like they could watch the movement right? and then they would be like well i'm gonna kind of idealize how he's moving it and kind of copy it but that's not using the body that's using like an ideal they can also be like analyze like some people could be like well he's internally rotating at the shoulder and externally rotating over here and you can you can analyze movement too you know you can which is great but it's still not physical. You're using your mind and the mind is not the body. Okay. 
And then, uh, then you have, um, then you have someone who uses emotion. This is another way of doing it. They could get that. It's like, they may not analyze it. They may not idealize it. They might just be like, Hey, I'm going to give 110% and I'm going to make that movement. But, and it could be from willpower or an emotion which you'll make the movement, but it won't be from the body. You'll damage the body while doing it. It's like you have four cups, right? Yeah. You have your physical cup. You have, you have your like, uh, you want to do like your, your uh, analytical cup or you can, you have your ideal cup and then you have, you know, uh, uh, the um well, the physical suit, and then you have the uh the the willpower the emotions so there's different there's this four dimensional thing going on and there's more right. dimensions than that but we'll start there right so think that uh, a lot of athletes are only filling one cup but the thing is that the cup that never gets nourished is the one that's our physical body and so the problem is that we have a physical body and no one cares to take it for a test drive and to open it and to learn about it we'd rather learn a book and then try to like use our minds to consciously direct attention without feeling our bodies. So you could see how that could be a uh, complicated strategy, right? Totally. And, and what's really interesting to me is this, this notion of as athletes, we can be using energies that, that allow us to perform physical movements, but don't actually allow us to embody the movement itself. Like the difference between those two seems one, it just seems absolutely shocking, right? That we can make a movement and that it could be driven from something different than our actual like embodiment of the movement. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Like, um, you'd be, um, you'd be mind blown if you, if we could analyze and figure out why athletes move certain ways. And it's because um, there's cellular data of past experiences and traumas and, and, and injuries and everything, all that gets stored in the body, in those, in our cells, in those glial cells and the fascia traps it in scar tissue. And so I guess how, or I don't think athletes may understand that sometimes they're moving out of an emotion from years ago but it could be damaging the body like the same movement they made in a trauma years ago. And it's wild because no one can differentiate past to present. So they're using a past uh, body that's tense, right? That's like a uh, inner survival response to make a movement. But the thing is that at this point in time, the nervous system is shut off. And when it's shut off, well, this amazing neural network of nerves that connect your spinal cord and brain, well, it's, it, it goes on vacation. It goes to the beach and it says, hey, guess what? You, your body is off. It's too tense. The fascia is smashing everything like a Coke can. Well, I can't really do anything. So now you're just going to have to make movements and you're going to have to micromanage your movements, which is really, really complicated, you know? And in this context, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but the, the idea of trauma could be injury that came through sport, right? It could be, you know, if we, if we, you know, if we're a football player or a basketball player or a hockey player, if we made a cut and, you know, blew out our knee or if we had an injury like that, or, or it could be a psychological trauma of some sort, whether it's, you know, a devastating interaction that occurred or, I mean, these traumas don't necessarily have to be that this big T trauma that we usually associate with that word, right? Right, this could be something real small. This could be yeah. like you heard a, a really loud noise that scared you when you were at the age of two, but you forgot about it. Then your body tends to great force to protect you. So that worked with clients like this before. We're like, they don't know why that their bodies don't work. But then when we work on when I work on them and we open up the fascia and we open up the tendons, we open up the joints and all this stuff, then they remember the memory and they're like and then they tell me, I don't have to tell them. They tell me, oh, you know, whenever I was two, this happened, or when I was three or four, or whatever, five, and they remember it very clear. 
And it's like wild because it's almost you can retrieve a, a very um, vivid memory uh, from the cells when you open up tissue. And then it plays like a movie for the person in present time, but they're not reenacting it if you can open up the deep fascia. And there's not many people that, op that address deep fascia. They're all addressing superficial fascia, around myofascia uh, openings and techniques, and none of it's getting to the bone, getting to the, to the bone and, and opening up you know, the body at its primordial attachment, which is at the bone, to the marrow. And that's a, that's a whole nother conversation, but the tissue, the, the, the tissue moves the bones. So, so what does that, oh my gosh, there, there's, there, there's a lot going up for you. This is really energizing. What, what is that? First and foremost, what is the first step for somebody who wants to, to begin unwinding, even if it is just the surface level, unwinding the fascia. And then how do they begin to do that deep fascia work? Like what, what does that take? Well, that takes some attention to detail um, because uh, people, uh, they want to work muscles, right? They want to work the fascia, but then we have to go deeper than just superficial fascia. We have to go deeper than, uh, you know, you know, muscles, you know, we got to go deeper to the bone. Okay. And mm -hmm. the only way we can open up that attachment of the tendon in deep fascia of the bone and also at the joint well that i just give you the answer people have to start addressing the gateways of the body and they don't even know what they are it's it's wild you could ask you could ask people they do over 10 20 30 years of schooling they can't tell you how do i open a joint you know and so the big thing is being able to address and maybe open one to open a joint. And people are like, well, how do I do that? And so this is something I, I, I watch professional athletes not do this. I watch amateur athletes not do this. I watch Olympic athletes not do this. And then they all end up with a joint injury. Well, it's because you're not addressing that deep fascia tendon attachment. And to tell you the truth, the tendon and deep fascia are not any different. They're not, they're the same structure of collagen tissue. And everyone's separating, everyone in America likes to compartmentalize and separate everything out like it's a separate structure. Uh, I guess it's a, I guess it might be an easy way to learn it, I guess, but everything is as one. Um, organs are as one. The tissue, the, the fascia bodysuit or supersuit, you could call it is as one and works as one. It isn't like, oh, I have fascia of my bicep and that is just that, my bicep. No, actually that, that fascia goes all the way, you know, up my arm, up to my skull, down to my foot. And they have like all of these different ports and gateways for it. It's like whoever designed this was an absolute genius. And this, the thing is that no one uses it. It can emit a massive amounts of energy and can contribute to uh, feats of movement that are nearly impossible if open. But no one knows it because, well, they have an experience that they can, they, it's like watching a movie, but then not like embodying it, you know? They're like, oh, that was a great movie. That was incredible. But then people have no idea that their bodies could maybe do the same thing if they started to practice. And so that's the word there is practice. Um, physical practice, Eastern do every day and I mean they're not on their they're, we're not they're not working on social media they're not working on their computers and iPhones and everything they're opening up their fascia they're opening up their joints they're working on movements to open their bodies to calm their nervous systems because they know that if they can't calm themselves their life will be suffering and we don't want suffering right mm -hmm. and so uh so they do practice to calm their body so then they can receive present life instead of past suffering. Okay. And this is through scriptures of thousands and thousands of years. You can read from all different cultures. It's very, very intelligent, but you have to open the physical flesh body that you live in. Now I know everyone wants to ascend to like the crown chakra or the white light or whatever. That's all great and all that, but you have to open the placeholder for all the energy, which is that deep fascia. And if you don't do that, well, 
your spiritual ascension is not going to quite go as well as you, you know? So <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so any, I didn't add that, add that in many ways. Um, the, <laughs> so, um, the thing is that, yeah, there's practices that can be done. Um, and the thing is though, being able to understand how tendons and joints work, it's kind of like the starting, um, the starting practice. Uh, you can legitimately unwind your tendons, but think about how many times they can wind up, like mm -hmm. hundreds to thousands of rotations, because everything's like spiral, like a towel, and almost like DNA. It's kind of interesting. There's no coincidences in, in science, and there's no coincidences in how things are synchronistic. I mean, like everyone's like, well, that's a coincidence. I was like, no, actually, it's not. You know, <laughs> it's like our body's trying to tell us, guess what? Your, your tissue is shaped just like your DNA. And I was like, why? I mean, someone's trying to tell us something. It's like, again, it's a breadcrumb, but no one's taking it. So, <laughs> like, so it's kind of, I find it uh, ironic, but also kind of hilarious at the same time. Um, you know, so, so yeah, it's getting to know the spiral, you know, getting to know, opening that, being able to know how to open a joint is, is actually huge because if you can't, you can't open up the, this, it's a, it's a towel. It's, it's, you know, the towel is spiral, it's circular, right? But no one, everyone does linear stretching. They don't do circular. They don't unwind. They try to pull. They think that you want to pull on something and then you want to tear it and then you want to, you want to force it. You know, it's like, I think we talked about this before, really simple game. I could probably teach like some kindergartners and first graders about anatomy and they'd be able to learn it uh, right away. And it's, this is the game we'll play. You get the block, right? And so the block has different shapes. I have a triangle, I have a square, and I have a circle. Now, tell the kindergartner, okay, you have three shapes. You need to match the shapes. So if there's a circle shape, which, which shape will fit it? The circle, the square, or the triangle? And so in our culture, though, we choose the square and then we try to ram it into the circle. Okay. Because we don't understand the shape of the body. And mm -hmm. so it kind of blows my mind. And, uh, and, and so it's like, this has been going on for a long time and it's about shapes and you can teach shapes to anyone because, well, we all learn shapes. And so to learn the shape, then, and then you honor the shape within an opening and then you calm the nervous system down. You get out of that sympathetic response and you come back to the present and where you can receive the present instead of receiving a repetitive, like, you know, horrific recording of the past, you know, which is a really bad movie that I want to just like throw out of my collection. It's like having an old VCR and pressing play on the VCR. And it's, it's the movie of everything that was most horrible in your life. And you keep, you keep watching it. So, um, so yeah, it's just, it's wild, but yeah, to get to know the shapes and to get to know the practice to open up the shape. So there's this, this really interesting, I don't know whether it's, you know, no, no pun intended, whether it's a tension or whether it's just this kind of mismatch, but it, so we know, we know in, in the West, especially, there is a big focus on this sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. We, we understand that we need to calm down. We need to, to get our body in this optimal, rejuvenative, open, relaxed state. Yet so often we show up to practice or, or even when we talk about the peripheral activities that are related to athletic performance, especially as we're training and we're, we're getting ready to peak, it seems like most of our training is oriented towards what's going to turn up our nervous system rather than turn it down and calm it down. You're saying it, it's, it is really the opposite. We need to have this calm state and be able to carry that through into our performance itself. That's actually a very intelligent point. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying that because I don't think many sports coaches, trainers, whatever you name it, uh, specialists actually know how to calm down the nervous system. Mm. That's actually a very big issue. And this is what 
they that's is what they taught they they teach mar, they teach east in the east and martial arts and everything uh, and, and so on and this is um what yoke was made for too i don't know if most yogis know this but that it was made to open the body up to calm the nervous system down so then you may meditate after doing yoga okay um again practice movement movements whatever you know different martial arts you know they open up joints in the body to calm down the nervous system out of the past okay mm -hmm. the thing is that the that the, if you don't do this you you're not gonna get to meditate or direct attention so it's a very backwards thing that goes on in the west they're like they're saying that they're just going to i'm going to spend time throughout the day to meditate whenever right. they have thousands of pounds of tensile or tension force in that fascia that collagen super suit pulling hard like they're in some sort of event while they're trying to meditate now you see how that doesn't work you see that i'm talking i mean what they know of two thousand pounds per square inch of tensile force which i believe it's even more you know that that the, that super suit of fascia can make to help protect us and also protect us from disease and spread of disease and so on um but the thing is that everyone no one knows how to open that up uh, and how to get that to to expand and so you have blood flow and energy if you have blood flow and energy and then the lymph starts flowing now guess what the nervous system can calm down and start to turn back on so then it will work for you it's a very intricate system the nervous system is but if it is in a heightened state it gets shut off it's very fragile but when you calm it down then it'll it has every different neural network of movement for you to do and it will do it for you that's why these athletes that are in the zone can do anything because they have an open turned on nervous system and i'm not talking about turned on meaning sympathetic i'm talking turned on meaning calm parasympathetic meaning an open an open uh uh like like an open control center that has all of its pathways active okay mm -hmm. But the only reason, the only way that can happen is if we release the tension in the fascia that is, that is upregulating that, that sympathetic fight or flight response. So is, I, what, what is so crazy to me, Scott, is, is I think about like, okay, if I, I remember times showing up to practices and, and even just training sessions in, in the studio and what, I, I never understood, and I imagine that a lot of athletes and coaches don't understand, is that unless we're consciously cultivating a practice like this, where we're truly spending the time to unwind the fascia, to release that tension, I show up to what I feel like is a new practice, a new day. I mean, how, how often do we talk about in the context of sport, whatever sport it is, you know, you're on to the next play, next play, next game, next practice. We're always thinking forward, but our bodies are always playing from the past, and that challenge is so it just seems when you share it in that context it makes total sense to me and i go oh of course i wouldn't want my body in the past but then i also recognize so many athletes and coaches don't recognize that that's happening oh no they don't even know what's happening in their own body so how would they know what's happening in their athletes bodies <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean again this it goes back to am i going to learn from a teacher that learns his work from a book or, I'm a, or from a, an ideal or from like, a, or it could be from ego too, who knows. Um, but the thing is that, I, or am I gonna learn from someone that actually practices and embodies it? That's, that's the thing. And if they embody it, then they can relate and be like, oh, I know what they're feeling because I felt that because I can feel that part of my body. And so it's imperative. This is something sport does not have at all. Like, and it blows my mind because it's based off the body. They don't have practitioners that actually embody their work that can actually connect the athlete and be like, hey, I've felt that in my tissue and I know what it does. I know what it connects to and let me help you with it, you know? Instead, they have a book that they've studied and all that. And it's like, it shows you anatomy chart, like everything's perfect. Well, the anatomy is not like that. Like the organs aren't even the same place on anatomy chart. They move around, you know? And so I find it very interesting you know um but i would you know i would love to have 
you know, sport, because sport is really influential. If sport can change as far as the understanding of the body and performance and, and health, then people will, can, will start to, to learn because people love sport. It's a great platform to learn from. However, I would love to like continue to integrate this into sport where people could have uh, practices and, and it's not just for performance because health is performance. Right. If you don't have health, you don't have performance. You are, that's, that's basically, again, going back to using the emotional cup or back to using the, oh, I'm going to idealize it. But then eventually the body will tell you, well, your ideal, you've maxed out the, your ideals have maxed out my body. And now you're going to destroy a tendon and blow up a joint or tear a muscle, you know? Or you could use, you can analyze until the cows come home, but it needs to be, we need to feel our bodies. We are animals. We should be moving like animals. Animals, you see animals every day? The animals, they don't, have, they don't take courses on the body. Do you see the dogs being like, oh, they're at school now learning how to stretch? No, actually, it's in their, it's in their genetics. It's in their, they, they instinctively know how to open up their fascia. How do they know more about anatomy than we do? That's incredible. I, if you want to see good, the best, uh, the best stretchers and openers in the world, watch a cat. Watch mm -hmm. a cat. Watch a wild cat stretch. And and I'd watch that video over and over and over again, because our bodies are supposed to do that. <laughs> like and so. <laughs> 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 but again, they're not sitting at desks that you know that they're using their bodies all the time you know what i'm saying <laughs> so their injuries scott are this really fascinating pain injuries they're this fascinating dimension to performance right so so we're at the future of sport in july what we're really focused on at this year's conference is looking at this idea of an athletic life cycle training performance recovery and transition and where where it's so fascinating to, to look at this lens is to say, okay, what if we're recovering through an injury? So often we go, you and I have talked about this before, but pain and injury tends to be this, we, we tend to treat symptoms, right? We tend to respond to that acute thing. Okay, my knee hurts, I need to treat my knee. Yeah, versus, yeah. versus recognizing what you're saying, this is an energetic imbalance. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought this up. Oh man. So this is a, um, something I have to do with every athlete I've ever trained in my life. Um, this is so important you brought this up. So uh, <clears throat> this is, and again, it comes with the misunderstanding of the body. I'm so glad you, you brought this up. It's like the people and athletes fixate on symptomatic echoes. Symptomatic echoes are pain being uh, presented in a part of the body. Mm. and it might also say say an athlete says oh my shoulder hurts so what will happen is in our culture since we don't understand the body as a whole and it needs to be developed we want to fix it so if something hurts then therefore we come to the understanding uh, uh we tell our you know our, the the public and the athletes are injured mm. and so this echo of the pain which is information which is a sensation about to open which will turn information which will travel to a different part of the body and so the thing is that we don't even get to that point because the athlete immediately is fixating on it is injured and therefore i need to fix my shoulder whenever it could be like his it could be his coming from his leg could be coming from his ankle could be coming from other arm who knows? I mean, the fascia is all one. So the problem is then we fixate on fixing instead of we, we should be fixated on developing, you know, our bodies so we can feel them. So this is why I watch again. I love hockey. I play my whole life. I always watch hockey. Uh, I'm watching the NHL network every second. And I see upper body injury, lower body injury. I see all these announcements and everything. But the thing is, though, these aren't injuries. Mm -hmm. These are the body saying, Hey, could you open up my right, you know, right hamstring because it's a messing up my left shoulder, but they will not get to feel that until they opened up the shoulder and then maybe opened up the other shoulder and then the tissue will move and then the sensations move. 
And then like that sensation, even it, that shoulder thing might go away in two seconds, literally two seconds. I'll work with someone, they think their shoulder's injured. We start working on it. It goes away in two seconds. And then they're like, oh my God, my hip is killing me. And I'm like, oh, wow. So then we learn more. It had to do more with the hip, but then the hip, and then we go down the ankle and the ankle is even worse, but they're not getting it. Know why? Because scar tissue has so much force and, and, it, and it impinges the nerve. It's like having an elephant step on a nerve. And you're not going to, the brain's, it blacks out the brain map. You know, like you have a, a map, right? You know, you have that legend and everything. Well, then that, that the brain has the map. And then the brain, whenever the fascia smashes the nerve, well, then there's no transmission. The nerves are in the nervous system. And so guess what? There's nothing there. So then the brain is like, well, we don't have a bicep. So I guess that's great. So, so what every athlete who sees this needs to understand is, and every coach too, you can perform something physically without actually using the muscles that you're trying to use to perform. That's true. I think most of the time, uh, except for some very, very high level athletes that are very talented and have amazing genetics or, and also doing practices, which there are a few out there, um, you know, that the people, uh, athletes are using, they're using their fascia and their tendons to their trauma. They're using a trauma body and old scar tissue and tension that's wound up in tendons to make their movements, which then will make them worse at their sport, but then later will make their health just as, you know, just as bad, which that's actually the more important point is that you can see athletes later in their career they some of them are very unhealthy because they're still in the sport they're still in the hit they're still you know they could be in the good stuff they could be in the they could be in the trauma stuff whatever but the body's still charged we have to uncharge the body you know and that's the that electrical charge that gets stuck in the our that that tissue and it, it makes us like uh like las vegas you know like go to las vegas right it's so stimulating i mean it puts your body into some sort of shock but that's the way people are especially athletes but after their careers you can look at some athletes and they, they ultra age because their bodies are still in sport they're still in injury they're still in that game you know it could have been a good game it could have been a bad game what it might be but they're stuck in it and their bot, their fosh is telling their brain that they're still playing, and so how do we get that to calm down? And so the body can heal itself and recover. Uh, some athletes actually never recover, but they're at the gym five days a week, yeah. which I still don't understand. And then they're the ones that tear the tendons and have to have surgery after surgery after surgery. Now, if I have to see another surgery for an NHL goaltender, I'm gonna lose it, you know. Like they're just not being taught how to open their joints. It's 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 kind of ridiculous, but it it, it just goes backwards, right? Like it, it just has this sense of of misaligned prioritization for for the athlete, and just in in what we in what we're orienting ourselves towards from a training perspective, from a recovery perspective, from all of it. Right? This is so so. This has been. Scott, as always, incredibly energizing, and we're we're coming up on on time here. So I want to do uh, a couple things real quick. I think we have one question from the audience. So Alexander, if you saw, I just dropped something into the chat. If you guys have questions, uh, please feel free to either drop them in the chat, or we can call on you and, and you can ask Scott directly any of the questions that are coming up for you. Scott, is that cool? Great. Cool. And before we do that, what I do want to ask is, so Scott, what we've talked about this this incredible spectrum so far. At the conference in July, what can people expect from your presentation and the work that you're going to be demonstrating? Well, um, I'm going to actually show people uh, a little bit of a practice. And I, obviously, I'm, there's uh, so many things to talk about for the implications of health and performance with our, with our Foster Super Suit. However, we need to learn how to practice. So the big thing is, is that obviously we'll I will teach uh, what's my all my experiences the last 18 years of working with it and so on with my own ventures and working with numerous clients 
uh, with different ailments and athletes and so on. But I, the big thing is teaching, teaching the people to come to it, athletes and, and, and uh, uh, people that will be there, how to start their practice to start opening up their fascia and tendon and open up their body so then they can start to receive life in the present. And when you do that, then you get health. And so this is about health. When you get health, you get performance. So I, I will, I'm I really excited to teach and start to, to give people something to start to feel. And then guess what? Then their bodies will start to unwind and, and then they're going to get They'll start to receive information, intuition, instinct. You become an open vessel. An open vessel receives. A closed vessel, well, it doesn't receive anything. Then that's why go the book and go learn about something. Well, you know, let's let's be like an animal. Let's be let's be an animal. You know. So what what comes screaming through for me right there, Scott, is is this notion of this notion of a growth mindset, right? And we we have this this focus of, okay, I can, I can cognitively reframe, I can orient myself from a, from a psychological standpoint towards certain processes and, and certain motivating drives and, and, and just worldviews. But what I think is a really interesting dynamic is to wonder, is that going to help me if I'm walking around with all of this tension and my body's wound up? If I'm living in the past physiologically, does it, does it really allow me to perform optimally if I can't get my body to receive that present moment experience? No, because you're not in that that zone state, that effortless zone parasympathetic state, you know, and it's and that it, it's just not something that most people are, get into because they aren't doing that daily practice to help nourish and take care of their this precious vessel that we have that is it's extraordinary it's even more extraordinary than i could ever imagine because each day you practice you learn more about how extraordinary it is wow guys this has been uh, incredible Devin, nathan alexander julie ken thank you guys for, for jumping on and watching anybody watching on facebook live thank you guys so much for for being part of this conversation and if you guys have questions please feel free to either you can drop them in the chat right now or feel free to to reach out directly and we can connect you with scott scott is just absolutely incredible the wealth of knowledge scott that you bring to this lens is so energizing and i think so many of us intuitively recognize right as athletes we can go through a moment of performance and go I don't know how or why, but my body doesn't feel like it's here right now. I may have been, you know, primed and ready in all the other ways that I think, but I don't think I'm here right now. And I, and I see this work, the fascia, this super suit that we have as such a critical piece to getting there is, uh, this is, it's really cool. Is there anything else you want to share before we wind down uh, this conversation, this presentation? Um, well, I, I see like a few questions showing up here. Yeah. Uh, the, I guess people are trying to figure out how to learn more about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess, I guess, uh, can I? Please, uh, where, where can they throw, connect with you? Throw in the website maybe, or? Please, please. Um, well, the, my website is uh, aspireflex.life. Um, and you go to the website, it gives you a little more information. Obviously, um, it's better experience than red. <laughs> and the thing is that, uh, uh, you can also go to, um, there's a YouTube site that I will be vamping up again too. And that's also under Aspire Flex. And, or if you type in Aspire Sports Training, uh, I'll be doing more bits on that. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, I can be reached at scott at aspireflex.life. Uh, uh, yeah, send me an email too and so on. Um, to just drop me a line. Um, also, uh, on Facebook also too under my my name Scott Botor so and and we should add to Scott so for those of you guys watching you'll be the first ones to hear about this we've been working on putting a course together specifically with Scott's practices so you can look out for that as well and and Scott correct me if I'm wrong but that is that might be a really good introductory place too when it's ready for people to, to start developing these practices yeah and it's it's crazy I, I can give I give a person one practice, right? And they do it every day and they come back to me after, uh, after the sessions and, the, and they're completely different and they, they can 
they can reiterate their experience, their body being so different, but then there, it changes their life. And it's just like, it's kind of wild. And it's like, it's so simple, but to have the attention to do something for, let's just say to do a practice for 10 minutes straight, like most people don't have that discipline, but guess what? If you do, you can open your body and then receive that present state, which is like receiving a bunch of presents and mail that you should have received a long time ago and gifts that have been waiting for you forever. But the, but you keep telling the universe, oh, I'm in this problematic trauma, but it's not now we're not in the problem now. Now it's like you can receive, you know, a lot of great things. And that's not just you can receive like great things that you want in your life. But the big thing is you receive health. Health will bring all of this, but the health only happens with an open body that has open blood flow and energy. And, and the only way to do that is to open up that deep fascia. That's, that's what, I mean, in this, we're working with the physical. Maybe in the next one we do more energetic, but we have to open up the physical, so. Scott, final question, just because these, these keep jumping in and I love this. What do you think, or, or let me rephrase this, what do you see as the future of sport? Well, the future of sport, that would be athletes um, practicing together as a team. You know, the, you know what's funny about this? I will talk about this at the, at the work, at, at, the, at the festival. And, and this has already been done, actually. The greatest sports teams of all time, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this at the festival, there was one specific sports team that did this and they crushed every team they ever played okay and they did it as a team they practiced as a team for an hour before every game and it put them all in the zone and guess what they were one cohesive unit they were unstoppable now think about that you just think about that you know we can the sport can lead into something much greater but everyone has to practice together and then everyone will start to open up and feel and get information and become a master of their own body and not have to depend on practitioners doctors you know celebrities whatever it might be to tell them what to do you know and so that's that's the future that was powerful, Scott. Wow. Thank you, Scott, for, for being on today. Guys, uh, for the conference, if you have not gotten a ticket yet, please go grab your pass today, live.theomniathlete.com. Go check out Scott's website, reach out, and just connect with him. Dive literally as deep into his world as you possibly can. This work is not just life-changing for your performance, but as Scott said, for your health in general, too. And this is the first, Scott is helping us kick off a series where we're, every week we're going to be bringing presentations to you of speakers at this year's conference. And it's really incredible. So not only get, do you get a chance to connect with Scott, but you have a chance to connect with a host of speakers that are going to bring practices that are very wide and diverse to the lens of elevating consciousness and performance through sports. So thank you guys for being here. And until next time, we'll see everybody soon. No, thanks for having me. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm.